Can we all try something? Can we all please try to stop using the word anti-Semitism, which is opaque, has historical and political context, and obfuscates the true meaning of how the word is understood today? Instead, can we please start saying anti-Jew hate or anti-Jewish racism or anti-Jew bigotry? Let's start calling it like it is and not allowing antiquated, more polite terms to lessen the blow. I promise it'll be a lot more arresting for someone to be called a Jew hater or anti-Jew or anti-Jewish racist than an anti-Semite. So went the text of an infographic I posted on Instagram back in May of this year. The idea had been lodged in my mind after too many frustrating interactions with folks online, where instead of having the black and white conversation of, is this anti-Jew hate or not, we'd get lost in some pseudo-academic nonsense about the term anti-Semitism itself. And you'll notice I often prefer to say anti-Jew as opposed to anti-Jewish, because hate against us is never about the religion. No one hates us because of our theology. It's not the Judaism they hate. It's the person. It's the Jew. So, in the words of MTV's Real World, I wanted the Jewish community to stop being polite and start getting real. So, I reached out to a few of the legacy Jewish organizations to ask if they would consider changing their official language moving forward. One disagreed with my assertion and said, we have bigger fish to fry, which, although true, I felt to be a little short-sighted. And the other said it was an interesting concept, but wasn't confident it would pan out. It was around this time that by a stroke of luck, my mother, Julie, who, as some of you may know, is the current chairwoman of Jewish Federations of North America, reached out to connect me with a woman named Gretchen Barton, who is the founder and principal of Worthy Strategy Group, a research and behavioral science consulting group, which basically means they get hard data and deep understanding about how people think and feel about a whole host of issues. Gretchen had been presenting JFNA with some of her findings surrounding anti-Jewish hate, including what messaging about Jews is successfully reaching people online and what's actually shutting people down. Gretchen is amazing. She's warm and intelligent and very passionate about this work. We'll definitely have her on the show at some point. And also, by the way, not Jewish. So anyway, I told Gretchen my idea about ditching the word anti-Semitism, and she agreed to try it out in her research. This manifested in three ways. First, she and her team had already built a library of memes and GIFs with different messaging to test the response on social media. Their post got something like 60 million views, so a lot of data. What she observed was that whenever the meme labeled something as anti-Semitism, the majority of the comments would say, no, it isn't. Or if the message was, don't be anti-Semitic, the comments would be, but this isn't anti-Semitic. So that was the first indication that this term is ineffective. It's too ill-defined, too misunderstood, too often misused. Second, she convened an ethnography, which is a word I learned today, and basically means she gathered an online panel of 15,000 diverse Americans. And the results were stark. While the vast majority of American Jews believe that anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism, which, spoiler alert, it totally does, but that's for another episode, only 13% of these panelists agreed. So again, something about the term anti-Semitism is leaving too much room for interpretation and rendering it ineffective as a tool for calling out hate and changing minds. Lastly, and most pointedly, she showed the panel images and clips of anti-Jewish things and asked, What do you most strongly feel you are seeing? Is it anti-Semitism, anti-Jew bigotry, anti-Jewish racism, etc., with a litany of terms? And the most popular response to these prompts was that they were witnessing racism. Racism, anti-Jewish hate, anti-Jewish bigotry, anti-Jewish racism, all these terms were much more easily identifiable and relatable for people than anti-Semitism. So to recap, We got to start telling it like it is. The people of planet Earth are not all working from the same definition of what anti-Semitism is. I mean, even saying the word out loud, it's a bit ridiculous. Like, why do we acquiesce to the use of this cryptic scholarly word to describe what is in reality simply anti-Jewish hate? Why are we making it harder and more complicated for ourselves? I mean, what other minority group is consistently lobbying institutions to simply agree on a preferred definition of what hate against them consists of. 
It's madness. And we now know, scientifically and anecdotally, that people are much more sensitive to overt racism and bigotry than to this obscure and ambiguous term. Now that you're aware of this mission I'm on, you'll notice I almost never use the word anti-Semitism on this podcast, in my speeches, or online. It's always anti-Jew hate or anti-Jewish racism or anti-Jew bigotry for me. So my challenge to you, dear audience, is to pick whichever alternate term you like best and start using it in your conversations, your group chats, your workplaces, your public dispatches. Calling out this hate in terms that everyone can understand is a critical step towards fighting it. And now that you know better, my mission is your mission too. This is the third episode of Being Jewish with me, Jonah Platt. guest today is one unique dude. He served in the Navy, he's worked in radio, he toured the world as Justin Bieber's bodyguard. He's touched many different facets of the music industry and since converting to Judaism has been an advocate for young Jews everywhere in the fight against anti-Jewish hate. Welcome, Kenny Hamilton. Thank you, sir. I appreciate being here. Oh, it's great to have you, man. Actually, funny connection, you met my wife before you met me because you took her class at Rise Nation. Oh, wait. Who's your wife? Courtney. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, you waited to tell me that for yeah. the reaction. Oh, like, yeah. Yep. That's dope. I yeah. actually missed that place. Right That's, on. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. That's so crazy. Courtney and Platt. That's right. Duh. There you go. Got it. Okay. <laughs> well, shout out to Courtney. Shout out to Courtney. Every episode, basically, we have a shout out to Courtney, which, you know, it's appropriate. <laughs> I love it. Um, all right. So, like, you worked with the Beebs as his bodyguard and road manager from 2011 to 2013, right? Is that right? Yeah, Ish. a little longer before that, but we'll get into it. Yeah. Okay, so like, how did that come to be? So I got into radio to be able to work with artists. That was my whole goal and plan. Well, in college, I had a radio show. I have a little bit of radio knowledge. Maybe I can get a job in radio, and that's where I'll meet artists. So I ended up meeting Jermaine, meeting Scooter. So it worked um, out. It was a good yeah, plan. Yeah, and it worked out. Um, and then Scooter and I just started, we, work, we were working together. We had these rappers that he was managing. I was like the road manager. And during that time, he found Justin. So by the time he moved Justin to Atlanta, I was around, like driving him around to brought him to my radio station. I was like, hey, one day you're going to sit here. So before people knew Justin Bieber, two and a half years almost, we were already together and just like trying to figure it out. Once Justin started getting bigger and bigger, um, you know, Scooter was like, oh, we need to find a security person for him. And I was like, oh, I know plenty of people. And he was like, no, I want you to do it because I have a military background. I have a martial arts background. What and, kind of martial arts? Uh, Wing Chun Kung Fu. Oh. With all of that, it was like, no, I want you to do it. But more so, it wasn't about security. It was about having people around who he trusted. Of course. But he was 14, about to be 15 around this time. Um, and then everything started rolling. So uh, speaking of Scooter, ha did he play any role in your journey towards Judaism where you eventually found yourself? Inadvertently, Yes. Um, Cause now, it, I mean, now he's such a big vocal voice for yeah. the community, especially since October 7th. So I was just curious yeah. if that was a part it's, of it. It's so funny. So we were hanging out. I remember opening his like freezer, like we, you know, we're trying to find something to eat and he's like, I don't know, whatever you find in there, you open the refrigerator and you open a freezer and you see all these like frozen Tupperware bowls uh -huh. and you're like, what is this? And he's like, oh, those are soups my mom sent down. <laughs> and one day, you know, you eat it and you're like, oh, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, he's like, oh, you can have them. She sends them down all the time. I was like, this, she just sends soups. She's like, yeah, Jewish mom's like, all you do is make soups. And I was like, oh, interesting. Culturally, he was the first Jew that I was ever around that I started seeing a lot more and I'm very close with his mom, mother and father. Um, and I've gotten a lot of culture and things through there. So like when I decided to convert, his mom knew before anyone around me knew, wow. but even before he knew. She was like the first phone call? She was the first phone call. Oh, amazing. When we went to Israel, the first trip that we did was in 2011. Um, Justin had two concerts there. Were you in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem? Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. And it's, it's so funny because 
I remember landing there. I was excited to go just because you're like, oh, we're going to the Holy Land. Like it's the holiest this is the epicenter of every religion, everything, right? Yeah. And we land there and it just felt like there was just a being that, like that a spirit that came through me was like, welcome home. Like you mm -hmm. feels like you're just, you're here. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm in the Holy, like the Holy Land. It was just, it was so invigorating. Also, growing up in the South, I thought Jewish meant white. Right. And that's almost what we're taught because it's like, you know, it, it's a black and white thing, especially growing up in the South, growing, you know, all my family growing through the civil rights era, Jim Crow, you know, obviously through slavery and things of that nature. My whole and my whole thing was if you're not black and you're white. Right. And Jews are white people. Yeah, that's what I was told. And there, I mean, that's not even just a Southern thing. I mean, that's people all over think that Jews are just white. Right. Because, you know, 80% of U.S. Jews are Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi. descent. So yeah. a lot of them are white presenting. I right. mean, the majority are. So it's yeah. in, in some ways, you know, you can't blame people for thinking that without the, the real knowledge and understanding. Yeah. But there is knowledge and understanding. And to we'll, be uh, we'll even talk about the Ashkenazi term because I never even heard that until maybe 10 years ago. Okay. Right. And so now we're like, all right, I'm walking through here. We're getting in the cars and we're driving. But then I'm like, that brother got a kip on. <laughs> like, why do you black people got kips on? And somebody looked at me like, they're Jewish. And I was like, black people ain't Jewish. Literally, that was the the, the one thought right. from the kid from Decatur, Georgia. Yeah. I was like, there ain't no black people that's Jewish. They was like, what are you talking about? Like, there's Jews all over the world. And I was like, huh. So the rest of this trip. You know, we're going through, we went everywhere. We went to Yad Vashem. We went to Oh, wow. How was that? Jerusalem. Was that that was powerful. meaningful, yeah. Um, for people that don't know, I mean, I, I assume that everyone that watches your podcast <laughs> or listens knows what Yad Maybe Yad not everybody. Is. But Yad Vashem is a Holocaust museum in Israel. Um, and at the time, we went with Scooter's grandmother, who was with us. His mom and dad was there as well. Um, his grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. It was, God rest her soul, Ma. Mm. Um, but when we walked in, you walk into Yad Vashem and they have Hitler's regime on the wall. Yeah. And I will never forget the feeling of standing next to her and she just froze because she saw the person that separated her from her brothers and sisters that killed them. The exact person. The exact person. Oh, man. And it gave me chills. And my, I lost my grandmother in 2003 and I was very close to my grandma. My grandmother grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. And I had the same feeling then that I did with my grandmother when she talked about the Klan and told me different things that happened in yeah. Mississippi because a lot of things happened in Mississippi. Yeah. Um, and I just, so that that was just one of the things that like stuck in my head forever and ever. Um, but being in Israel and going through, being through Jerusalem, the old city of David and seeing like all of these, I started to start educating myself a little bit more. It's like, hey, there are a lot of, East African, you know, Sephardic Jews. But when you say Sephardic, you're like, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, most people in this region are brown skinned or dark skinned. So then you start saying to yourself, like, okay, Israel's not a European country. Right. It's By a any stretch. Borg of everyone from Africa, from these places here that are Jewish and it's our homeland. It's where we feel like we're most safe. It's where we feel like we can go. Every yeah. place is kosher. The food's incredible. Doesn't yeah. matter where you go. Any highlights from that trip specifically? Things that really st stick out in your mind on that first time through? I learned what a Shabbat elevator is. Yeah. <laughs> we stayed at the Sheraton. I got in the elevator. I'm pushing the buttons and I'm like, huh, there's something's wrong. But we were on like the 46th floor. Oh, man. So... After like three floors, I'm like, I'm going to get off and just get on another elevator. And then I was like, see, this one works. And then you get downstairs and they're like, I was like, yo, there's a problem with the elevator. They're like, which one? And I said, this one. They're like, oh, that's the Shabbat elevator. I was like, what does that mean? They're like, for Orthodox <laughs> Jews, yeah. observant Jews of Shabbat, that, you know, you can't, can't operate push a anything. Button. And I was like, oh, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> I always say that. That was like one of the funniest that's so stories. That's funny, yeah. What were the Israeli believers like? Insane. Insane. Yeah. Um, that was every country. It was, it was, we had barricades outside on the street so no one could pull into the driveway because um, it was just hundreds of people outside. Is it true that you discovered you have a cousin who lives in Israel? Oh, yes. So uh, during the pandemic, that's funny. I don't know who gave you that, but. <laughs> I, have, I have an amazing research assistant, yeah. Samantha. She finds it all. During the pandemic, um, I did 23andMe, the DNA testing, mm -hmm. and David Stein, 
lives in Jerusalem and he's a sixth cousin, six or seven. It said, yeah, it said sixth or seventh cousin. So I look on the map and I'm like, eh, maybe that's so. But I have 25% European um, blood in me as well. That's a whole other conversation yeah, of when yeah. people try to say during slavery what was happening to the sure. slaves and things of that nature as well. And a lot of them are between Scotland, England, and that United Kingdom area. Huh. Um, and then David Stern is in Jerusalem. Did you ever connect with him? No, I, I tried, but no response. Oh, come on, David, if you're listening <laughs> to this, you know, Maybe Kenny's looking to for you. another email out. But yeah, <laughs> I, I saw that and I was like, ah. Oh. You know, I read that one of your inspirations before converting was was Malcolm X, who famously converted to Islam. So what, what's that yeah. connection? And so, and it's very intriguing because when Malcolm talked about his different ways of when he was in the street life in New York, converting to the Nation of Islam, and when him and the Nation of Islam started kind of going at the head, I don't want to get into that. There's a lot of speculation behind it. But the, there's one key point that I always thought was very interesting. And it was when he took his pilgrimage to Mecca. Mm -hmm. Because as he stated, he was told that Muslims were black, that the nation was black men and black this and black that. But he went on his pilgrimage to Mecca and he said that he was praying with all colored Muslims, white, Asian, black, you know, all these different people from all over the world were praying to, you know, Muhammad and they were all worshiping together. Mm -hmm. And so he went back and his message changed because he was told one thing into another. And I, and I, I kind of felt that same feeling of when I'm in Israel and I'm like, I'm thinking I'm going to another, literally like a European country. Mm -hmm. Like I, I had more uh, thoughts when I landed, I went to South Africa, we landed in Cape Town and I was so excited my first time in Africa and I get off the plane and I was like, wait, <laughs> It's all white people. Is this Switzerland? <laughs> yeah. Like, where are we? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. this don't feel like the Africa I was expecting to be in. Right. Um, and that that was a, a lot of it because it was like, well, y'all told me Jews mean we're white, but I'm just walking around with like African Jews and Middle Eastern, uh, you know, you have your Persian Jews, you have Moroccans and Ethiopians, all these different types of, of Jewish people. And then I started learning, you know, the Ashkenazi Jews from Europe. And that's where you have majority that came here. Because after the Holocaust as well, and where people were escaping Eastern Europe, so like Scooter's family is Hungarian, majority of them are mm -hmm. from Hungary. I have other friends that their families are Polish or some are Russian and things like that. And then you start understanding the dynamic of why. But then you talk to Ethiopian Jews. So like a lot of people don't realize like Ethiopian Jews don't celebrate Hanukkah, I want to say. And it was another um, Purim as well, I think is another holiday that they don't celebrate. The reason that they don't celebrate it is because where a lot of other Jews that went back during this time after they had already left. So Ethiopians, when they were pushed out, they never went back. Mm -hmm. They didn't start going back until a few hundred years ago when they were trying to get back. And really there's a lot more recently in the last hundred years to be completely honest, right? Oh yeah. Um, and even, you know about the migration, than even less than that. So I, I met a woman who came back over, I think she said 72, 73, Gadula. And she told me about the stories that their ancestors always talked about returning to the land of milk and honey. And they said for over 1,500 years, this is what they were told. This is what they thought about. So a lot of the other holidays that I said that they don't observe, I learned because they weren't there fighting in those wars or a part of that piece of history. So a lot of it was feeling like I was deceived. But then you start realizing as you get older, people just don't have the knowledge yeah. that you think they do. So I don't take it personal, but now I, I looked at it as... And it took me a long time to convert because I was worried about what everyone else thought. Who's everyone my, else? My family, my my father, my sisters, friends. Because it's like, you know, you grow up in the church. And I was like, you know, why do I have to buy a new suit every Easter? And what's the bunny for? Like, because it is. <laughs> like, okay, but I feel stressed now. Now I got to get a new suit every time. So I never thought about like, oh, it's Resurrection Sunday. I thought about I got to be the flies one at church. Right. I didn't care about nothing else, but like making sure I had my Stacey Adams and whatever color, you know, <laughs> suit I could wear. I would wear bright color suits at times. Yeah. I was, you know, one of those get guys. those pastels for yeah, Easter. Yeah, <laughs> you got to. And it's like, oh, then Easter egg hunt. But what does this have to do with anything? Right. I don't know. But this is what we're told. This is what we're taught. And it's like, it is this way because it is. But I just felt more of a connection. I was like, well, I have a direct relationship with God. The Old Testament or the Torah is God's word. Mm -hmm. And... Again, I don't mean this in any 
um, disrespectful way to the Christian community, but I look at the New Testament as people's opinions during that time. Mm -hmm. And then I was kind of like, well, what if this was a left-wing opinion? What if this was a right-wing opinion? What if this one was the Green Party? Like, mm. So then I was like, you know what? I don't know how to validate this, but we do know how to validate that it, we all agree that this is God's word. Mm. So from, from Genesis to Psalms, these books are all, are all God's word. And I want to follow that. Mm. And I'll be honest, I was telling somebody the other day, it's like, since my conversion, I felt closer to God, like a direct relationship with God. Like we speak more and I, I pray more. And um, there's a lot of other aspects. I love the idea of Shabbat. And I don't observe every Friday, but I, I would, I like to, but I make sure I say a prayer. I, I um, it's, it's just everything feels more direct, more powerful than it sense to me. Um, and you, you said you have a son. Mm -hmm. Do you have, is he your only child? Or you have more? Yeah, he's, he's my only child biologically. And then my girlfriend, we have, we have a family of four and she has a son as well. Um, our household is, is very Jewish. She's converting as well. Oh, that's amazing. Um, is she in the process now? We haven't started just yet. She said when the ring comes, then she's ready. Uh, fair enough. Yep. So we're working on that one. All right. All right. Um, no pressure. I got a good jeweler. He's in New York. There you go. So we step one might have already picked it out. Uh, okay. but, um, but yeah. And so I don't force it on them, but I'm starting to teach my son everything. Um, his mother is, a, is Southern Baptist as well. And, you know, I, I don't want to feel like I'm forcing anything on anyone, but we do plan to have more kids and those kids will be born into, into Judaism. Um, but there's just a lot of aspects. And you know, it's so crazy that people don't realize there's so many experiences of, of being black and being Jewish that are so similar, but people don't know it because they don't talk about it. Tell, please enlighten us. You know, I was in Israel 2022. Um, I had an artist that I was managing at the time who we had a couple Afrobeat records that did really well. We did a show in Tel Aviv, but also I had him do a record with um, Eliad, who's a big um, Israeli singer as well. Eliad's family is Moroccan and Iraqi Jewish. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hey, come to the house for, you know, having a big celebration for Shavuot. Of course, I'm, I'm coming over and, you know, I get there, you see all the food, they have a huge spread. And it's like black folks, like anytime we celebrate, everybody's cooking. But yeah. grandma was in the kitchen here. You got the auntie that always drinks a lot of wine before the meal comes. <laughs> and people know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. You got that one that's already sauced. You got the cousins that are sitting at the table like, hey, you want to go smoke a joint after right? this? <laughs> you got the the uncle that, you know, y'all don't like him because he cheated on, you know, your auntie, but he's still here because we got to celebrate. You got while we're eating, grandma's like, oh, you, you want any more? I said, no, I'm full. She takes three yep. more scoops, puts it on your plate. After the meal, you out there, all the OGs, as we call them, the big uncles, you outside playing cards, they smoking cigars, they drinking liquor. It's all the same. I was, I literally said, if I close my eyes, I might be back in Atlanta. Mm. Like, it's the same thing. It, it's like, you know, we celebrate family. We celebrate birthdays, but we do it big. We have once a week, we have big meals. So it's like Sunday dinners yep. after church and, and Shabbat, you have big, you know what I'm saying? It's totally. like, it's the observant of everything. And it's like, it's all rooted because we all come from this one region. Do you feel like that's the link is based on where we're from or it's, it's more of like a you know, like a cultural thing and a heart thing and a soul thing. That all is aspects of where we're rooted. Hmm. What was the reaction? You know, you said you were nervous as you were approaching your conversion. Like what was some of the responses and the reactions that you got from people close to you? Was, were, was um, everybody supportive, well, not supportive? Some of my uh, Ashkenazi Jewish friends were like, you sure you want to be oppressed twice? Right. <laughs> And I, I laughed it off, but then like over the last like 11 months, now I really now get it. Now you get it. It's like, I this really, is what I really, signed up for? I really, really get it, which is why I got even louder. Um, which we'll talk about also. And, you know, other folks, you know, supposed to black folks was like, there's a, a a cloud over Jews in the entertainment business. Like, we just run everything and it's all through here. And it's like, that's not true either. No. It was never like that. But then you go back to like, the actual history of Ashkenazis when they came to America and they didn't get opportunities as well. They didn't get opportunities to it. So it's like, okay, if I can't get hired at a firm, I'll just start my own firm. Right. They didn't get jobs and people got started their own. Right. 
Now, on the surface, when you're in America, especially during this time, it's still black versus white. So black people didn't have the same resources or opportunities as Jewish people did, as Italians, as other folks, because they stuck in their communities. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you go back to when slavery is over and people are like, oh, well, slavery is over, get over it. Well, you didn't let black folks learn how to read. You didn't let black right. folks learn how to write. Then slavery is over. We push you outside and say, okay, you're free. Oh, but guess what? You can't go in here. You can't go in here. You can't go in here. You can't vote. You can't do this. Yeah. So then you push them all to what became ghettos and redlining, and not letting black folks get loans and get houses. And that's where the systemic racism thing, the argument comes in. Sure. Because it's not an argument. It's just factual. Yeah. So I understand where a lot of it's rooted. But now being Jewish and understanding Jewish culture, I understand where that's rooted because when we say never again and the Holocaust happened to so many Ashkenazis and Jews everywhere else were being murdered. Jews throughout Africa were being murdered. Oh, I just yeah. talked about how Ethiopians literally told me for generations how they had to leave the major cities in Ethiopia because Christians and Muslims were murdering Jews by the by the numbers and boatloads. Yeah. And you look at the number of Jews throughout the Middle East and where they were pushed to Israel, that's, there's a reason why there's no Jews in Iraq or Iran. and yeah, They're all gone. They're, they're all in all Israel gone. or they're they dead. They were murdered and they had to leave and they had to flee. And so you go through that. You move to a country where you have opportunity. Whatever opportunities you can, yes, you're going to keep them within your households in here, right? So there's a, there's a lot of layers um, yeah. to that. And you look at a lot of the white people that were freedom riders. They were Jewish. Yeah, Freedom riders were ones that came down south to help blacks during civil rights and Jim Crow era and things of that nature. And, you know, now, like, people talk about Dr. King and... Um, I don't know Heschel. Thank you. Yeah. But that's not the only one. There were many others, like Bernie Sanders was one. And, and we were all about helping each other's communities and sticking together. Yeah. Um, and I just wish that more black people could see how more similar we are to the Jewish experience versus, you know, the, the white, like the Jewish experience isn't the white experience. Yes. It's interchangeable in times, but you have to understand there's so many different um, Jews around the world and so many different Jewish people. And it's not just all in one. And and the Jewish story is thousands of years older than the white Absolutely. American story, you know? So let's go back to your conversion. What's the final step where you're like, I'm ready to do this. I'm going to push the button. Dr. Bron Scooter's father actually asked me, he's like, so you want to convert? So are you, are you going to go, you know, which way are you going with it? And I didn't understand the question at first. So then I was like, let me really dive into the different sects to Orthodox, mm. to, um, you know, Kabbalah, to Reformed, which is what I ended up um, converting through. Mm -hmm. Um and I'm friends with uh, Yeshua Fat. It was Amari Stoudemire. Um, and when he was playing in Jerusalem and studying, he converted Orthodox. Yeah. And he's very observant. And we had a few conversations, you know, over the years, and just texting here and there just about different things. But, like, he really studies the Torah, really goes into it. And I was like, well, I kind of know the Old Testament and the Torah. So I was like, I think I'm, I have a good foundation of it. So I did end up going reform, but yeah, I went to the Kabbalah Center. I went to just to like really learn doing your due diligence about the sex between everything. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I had a friend in New York who was like, "Hey, if you're ready, I'll help you. You know, find a cantor and we'll go through it." And he ended up introducing me to uh, cantor Emma Letts at Stephen Weiss, who's a good friend now, and um, I ended up going through my conversion. How long was the program? Like, how long did it take you to do? Um, About nine months. Yeah, because they like to take you through, like, the calendar, right? They take you through it. Yeah, they take you through the calendar, and it's, like, one course a week, and, you know, you just you go through it all with different speakers and different things there. And it's, like, it's so funny because, like, when you convert to Christianity, it's, like, you go to church, you say you want to be saved, you, like, raise your hand, you go up, and you're good. You're in. And it's, like, oh, welcome. To, like, Jews are, like, why do you want to be Jewish? And it's, yeah. like, you, you go through a, well, because to make sure it's, like, rooted in your heart and things of that nature. And Christianity is also rooted in the heart too. Um, I try to be very careful. Like, no, of course. My but words, I, I think also with feel... Judaism, you're not just joining a religion, you're joining a tribe, yeah, you know? It's absolutely. not just something you can pick up and put down. Exactly. Now you're in it. Now you're in it. Yeah. Um, 
was there like what was something surprising you learned during that conversion process that like you had, had, had never heard of before, didn't know about Jews? And we're like, oh, that's interesting. The biggest thing was the holidays and the oppression and like mm. when you really break down all the different wars throughout time and stuff like that, that was more intriguing to me than anything else. Cause then you start putting in perspective, like, man, it's always people coming after the Jews. Yeah. Before, you know, when it was Judea and Samaria, each one of these went after Jewish people yeah. in this region to take control, not only of the resources, but to take control of the holiest land of holy lands. Yep. So like this last trip I just took to um, Israel and I went back through Jerusalem, I was able to see some of the new discovery that they found where they found this big pool where people went that led back up to the to the temple. Oh, that's we're right cool. by the Mount of Olives. We're right here. And then they're starting to find like shackles that had Hebrew writing on them. Mm -hmm. They're, they're finding all of this stuff. They're finding bones and skeletons because, you know, folks were murdered through there. And this is right where the first mosque is right here. Like all of this stuff is all around, yeah. but you're finding relics of Judaism. So it's like, you know, we're, we're in a time where history is either being, you know, whitewashed or just kind of wiped. And it's like, you can't, wipe away the history that Jews are from here. This is the ancestral. All the other stuff's built on top of the Jewish stuff. Everything's <laughs> built on top and they keep digging and digging and finding more and more um, evidence of such. Is there something that you learned during that time that like you really loved that you hold on to? I still love the aspect of Shabbat and the purpose and meaning of it. And especially today, Sitting down, no phones at the table, you speak to family, you're praying together, but we're losing that human connection with totally. each other that I feel like Shabbat is the most important thing that we could ever do, not only as Jews, but just as humans in a technological society. Yeah, it's a gift. I love the fact that Shabbat is not only about us sitting down and just reflecting on the week and, and you know, paying our respects to God, but it's... And our respects to each other. Yeah, I love that. And it's a very um, enlightening, enlightening thing that I, I think that still excites me the most. That's awesome. Everybody loves Shabbat. Yeah. I mean, it's great. My, my wife, Courtney, converted. I don't know if you knew oh, that. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. And her, her dad is, uh, so her family is like Italian-American. Okay. And every time her dad visits, he's like, we Shabbatin. Right. <laughs> he, he loves it. But then you can bring your own... Um, you bring your own flair to it. like Totally. Everybody's you know, got their own family traditions, yeah, their own yeah. things they like to do. And that's the other and... thing that over the years you start learning like, oh, my family is from, you know, my Persian Jewish friends. They're all from like different parts, but they all have different things that they do on mm -hmm. certain holidays that are different from, you know, my Ashkenazi friends and like everybody has it. So um, there's a, there's a black Jewish chef called, I think he's at the cooking gene on IG. And he does all these different like soul food kosher recipes Ooh. of just like food that you're like, oh, that's fire. Like with Sounds greens amazing. and with this and with that. It's not Michael Twitty, is it? That is his name. Michael Twitty? Yeah. yeah, yeah He's yeah. like the famous like yep. soul food and Jewish so he chef. he does yeah. all these things. And I was just like, man, I got to start, you know. Yeah. So I started trying to save some of his recipes and stuff. So now you're a black Jew. Yep. What's the most annoying questions you get? Why did you want to be Jewish? Or... Not even annoying. It's like, oh, what did you go and do that for? I get more things now of like, because of the war and everything else that's going on, of like, oh, you should know better. Are you speaking up for this and that? Mm. And I was like, I do know better. That's why I'm, I'm speaking up. What's been the reaction? Because you, you, you cover a couple of different circles that have been, you know, not necessarily the most supportive in, in terms of the music industry and yeah. the black community. And so, and, and, and specifically you're a manager too. So I know yeah. a lot of, you know, talent reps have an issue with this. That's because they've got client relationships and business relationships. Yeah. So I know there's a lot, you know, to navigate. So what, what's the calculus for you? And, you know, what's your react, the response been as you've stepped forward? It's been, it's been hard. It's been, it's been stressful, a lot of anxiety. You know, I try to laugh through a lot of it in the sense of not laughing at the situation, but laughing at like what comes to me a lot of times. Cause you get so many people that say things to you and you laugh because you're like, they just really don't understand. Yeah. And it, it it's 
It's twofold. And I think it's difficult because if you really look at where we where we have been headed as a society over the last 10 years, if you go against the majority, then you're looked at as like something just completely out of the norm. Well, I don't think that's a recent development. That sounds like sort of human nature, right? Yeah. But because of the rise of social media, it's roared its head mm. to a whole other being, mm-hmm. right? Um, politically, socially, I mean, you know, you look at cancel culture and rightfully so, like you can dig through the past of everything. We can't change the way society was. Cause I mean, right. if we want to go through it, then it's like, okay, well, let's go through everybody whose grandfather was racist and held black people back. I just say all that to say, like, I get it. There's, it's been very difficult. I've had clients who are jumping on the bandwagon of, of things and saying things out loud that you can tell that even they don't have the full story about it. Sure. And then you're looking at people, you know, the the campus protests and all these things like folks haven't even been to the Middle East. So then I have a wartime mindset when it comes to a lot of things that I can't speak about publicly because people will look at me like I'm crazy. What, what do you mean? I was in a war. Right. So I understand that if there's somebody in this building who's responsible for killing over 500 to 1,000 people and will probably try to do more because they want their Sharia law over anything. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand what that means Mm. that he's embedding himself here. You got to take him out. Right. So you understand the state. I understand it a thousand percent point of view, but you can't have, we used to say this in the military and this is why when they, they, you know, you say they, they train your mind or whatever, but you can't always talk to civilians about what you need to do to keep civilians safe. Right. And do I wish that there was no war? Absolutely. There's been war since the beginning of time. Yeah. There's certain things in, in life that are just not going to change, unfortunately, right now. We wish one day that it will. So it's it's hard to have conversations with people, and I try not to get in debates anymore. I try to just lead with facts. Have you been able to approach some of these clients? And yeah, have I've, a- had, I've never been. I've never not had a conversation with somebody that approaches me. I do know the difference between some folks that just don't listen to any other opinion outside of themselves, mm. or they just want to talk to people that affirm what they already believe, mm-hmm. which happens a lot on both sides. Sure. Um, it's not pretty and it's never been pretty in this region, but they're also like, I'm not going to let you tell me that like Israel is a white colonizing country. There were Ethiopians that were murdered on October 7th. Hezbollah has been attacking Israel since October 8th. Yep. Consistently, I got the apps. I'll show you. I get my phone goes off, and just, a lot of the same times every morning of just rocket attacks and the yeah. right. But there are a lot of black and brown Israelis and people in Israel, and so it's just like it, it's crazy when I hear people be like, "Oh, you should know better." Like they're oppressing, and I'm like, "Do you realize? Like I have Palestinian friends that will tell you the the equivalent of saying the N word and how dark Arabs are treated." Mm. in these other countries because colorism is an issue everywhere yeah um especially in these arab nations right and the things that happen in there like I, i've sat with people that live there i've talked to people that had to flee there and their families leave there because they tried to speak freely and they they know what sharia law means and it's like you know you get a lot of young people here now that are yelling this and that and fighting the resistance and you see these hamas flags and this and that and then something happens to them, they still gonna pick up the phone and call nine one one, right? And I, I say that to say it's like you can't have it both ways. So it's either you try to educate yourself, but you can't fight with people that don't want to educate themselves, and you can't fight with people that want to affirm what they want to believe to be true and not want to hear any other side or any other factual things that happen with it. Well, you can fight with them, you just can't get anywhere. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. it's like it's the same. It's like. When I go to Israel, like I love being there and I've been there many times now, but you're also under the, you know that, hey, every border around us, they want to kill everyone here. Yeah. They want to kill the black Jews as well, the African Jews and everyone I don't think that people can comprehend that everyday lived experience. Yeah. People who it's live like there. Israel is California, but Oregon wants to take us out. Washington wants to take us out. Arizona, yeah. Nevada, everything that borders us right. in Mexico are all enemies. Yeah. And we didn't choose them. Right. Because we never start the fight, but you have to protect yourself. Yeah. And that's one thing I don't understand that, you know, doesn't come into people's minds. Since you converted, 
How, have, have you felt welcomed by the Jewish community? Very welcomed by the Jewish community, absolutely. You know, I've been to different Shabbats and, I, you know, Stephen Weiss has been my temple of choice. It's very welcoming, but it's, it's the same. It's like, oh, you got to come to our house for Shabbat. It's literally the same as black folks say, oh, y'all got to come over. You know, you know, my wife, she cooks amazing dinner. Come yeah. on over Sunday, man. Y'all come for dinner. It's, it's the same thing that I grew up with. Yeah. You know, it's just ro rooted in, in love and in Judaism. In, in terms of your connection to Judaism, mm -hmm. has it changed since October 7th? It's it's just changed because it's made it stronger. Yeah. Like it's got me to a point where I've had people to say like, oh, I didn't realize you were like so Jewish. And I was like, I was been saying this stuff before October 7th. I was here and talking about it, but no one paid attention because it wasn't popular. Mm. Now it's all on the brains again. And so now it's popular. Um, I think it's just reaffirmed it and made it a lot stronger. Um, and almost in the senses where you feel like the world is against us in the world is against you being Jewish. Like people are like, oh, you wear your necklaces out and so proud. And I'm in America. So it's like Americans are ignorant. They they're looking for white Jews. They don't look for us black Jews or Sephardic Jews or yeah. any other type of Jewish people because they, they don't know they exist. Understand they exist. So I walk around freely, but I still feel safer as a Jew in Israel than I do in America right now. Yeah. Which is a crazy thing to say. Yep. But it's actually not that crazy. It's a common refrain. We actually, on the last episode of this podcast, had Montana Tucker on, and we touched oh. on the exact same thing. She feels the same way. I used to manage Montana when she was 15. Oh, no way. Yep. Well, speaking of Montana and uh, social media stars, you have a big following on social media yep. across channels. What has the reaction from that audience been? Because I imagine most of them are know you from your music career. Yeah. Um, and so what has the response been on social to, to you being Jewish and speaking out about Jewish issues? Uh, um, I get a lot of little DMs here and there. Supportive mm -hmm. ones or hateful ones? I get a lot of support. I get a lot of hateful ones. I mean, you know, I feel like if you can't be on social media and not get any hate, right? Nah. You know, people want you to die and you get the clowns <laughs> and the monkey the things that get through, and, you know, all stuff I've heard before. Yeah. But I just call them keyboard gangsters. That's know? right. And then also too, like you have a lot of bots. When I say bots, like they're literally oh yeah, companies in third world countries that are paid through other proxies to be able to just throw out misinformation. Absolutely. And crap. All right. La last question. Rosh Hashanah is in a few days coming yep. up. Uh, are you going to be celebrating Rosh Hashanah? Absolutely. And uh, so what's one resolution you have and one wish you have for the new year? I'm working on the resolution. My wish is that my business becomes more consistent. Meaning um, what? Meaning that in the music business is hard. Being a manager is hard, but I'm now partnering with friends that we created a new like advisory firm. It's where we kind of work across a lot of different variables throughout entertainment. Um, and I'm really liking that work a lot. Cool. Um, so I'm looking for the consistency in that because also too, like if you talk to a lot of actors and, and producers and stuff, they'll tell you about the film world and how after the strike, a lot of it hasn't really recovered. Oh yeah. We're, so it's, it's like, wait, you know, it's uh, survived to 25. Yeah. And so it's gotten really tough for everyone. And I just, I, I wish for consistency across all levels Yeah. because it's, we're all intertwined and it all affects each of us sure and going through a lot of tough times my resolution is for this this new year to actually like start praying every morning because i get up pretty early but now i'm like you know by the time i get up it's still middle of the day and on that side of the world mm -hmm. so now mm -hmm. like a resolution i have is to do my morning prayer and to feel in every morning what does that do for you it just i don't know it felt like it was like um it just i just felt even more connected to a whole other being and like Almost like I just like kind of floated up to earth and like I was talking to God face to face. Wow. You know, and um, I didn't, I hadn't felt that before. So it was really weird to like really feel that and be, you know, pulled into that energy. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. So those are my questions. Now we're going to take a couple questions from our Instagram followers. Okay. You can leave questions every week for whoever our guest is going to be. Here's a couple of great ones. And uh, shout out, I got to say, some of these questions come from my Hevra uh, at the Jewish Federation's uh, National Leadership Cabinet. So thank you guys for showing up this week. Um, Rach.Fleisch asks, will you have a bar mitzvah? Yeah, I will. I will. Because I, I I thought about just doing it in Israel. Right. Um, but then I was like, well, I got a lot of friends here too. So maybe I'd 
you know, we do something. Throw a little party? Yeah, you know. Yeah. You going to have a theme? That's what I'm thinking about because I, I turn 44 next year. And I'm like, oh, maybe we make it like, you know, Obama-ish <laughs> <laughs> and, and combine it all together somehow, you know. What does an Obama-themed bar mitzvah look I like? I have no idea. So every year, so like when I turned 42, I was like, oh, this is my Jackie Robinson year. Yeah, I think and of that. I do it in Jersey numbers too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but then 43, I was like, there's no legends with right. 43. I literally like went through the whole line, baseball, basketball. I was like, can't find anybody. So 44, the first thing you think of when I say 44, I think Obama. Underscore ran 718 asks, was it the latkes or the kugel that sold you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love a chocolate kugel. Uh, <laughs> chocolate or, kugel? Well, no, no, no. Uh, babka. Chocolate babka Ch is my yeah. favorite. Babka's so, amazing. Kugels are good, but it was the babka. That was the it. Babka, it was the babka is what got me. Um, and then I ain't not going to lie after I converted, cause I love Seinfeld and I always love Seinfeld. Yeah. But like I started getting a lot of the jokes even more. Yeah. Now. And I get the Bobka episode. Oh my God. <laughs> it was incredible. So there's a, the second question from underscore ran seven one eight is how do you like to blend tradition, the traditions with which you were raised with how you like to celebrate Jewish culture? I do it with food. Yeah. So like, you know, Yom Kippur is coming up. Yeah. So when I break fast, it's like, I got grits. <laughs> we got turkey bacon. Like my grits is fire. Trust me. Every Sunday. I believe it. Um, you know, we do the, I'll do, I have, I'll have like locks. Cause I already love like locks and uh, bagels and stuff as well. But like, yeah, I, I bring the grits in. We got pancakes. Like we really break a fast. If we going to do it, it's going to look like the whole lumberjack at Denny's plus everything at every soul food restaurant you done thought of um, with the lock keys. But yeah, I, I, I do it through food a lot. I love that. Um, and just adding my own. Because that's what it is. It's like adding your own like flair to it. And that's what you realize over the years. And so many people have so many different traditions. So I've just kind of created some of my own within the within the customary traditions. Amazing. All right, last question. Uh, Shalom Letters wants uh, says that Jewish teens are feeling really isolated right now. How do we find Jewish joy in such intense times? I feel like we find the joy in the moments. Because life is about moments, and as much pain as a lot of the moments are, there was just another attack at the University of Michigan, uh, and it's 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 hard being Jewish everywhere because of people that don't have all the knowledge and that are just, you know, they're jumping on the bandwagon with things. But we just have to know and keep telling ourselves that this will come to an end. We're not going anywhere. We've been resilient. We remain resilient but we remain together. Mm -hmm. You find joy in the togetherness. Um, for every young Jewish person out there that sees this or hears this, I would say, you know, stick with those who love you. And, you know, you have to be careful and just like watch out for yourselves right now until we can get a rain on, on all of the, the craziness. Hopefully it doesn't get worse before it gets better, but I, I truly believe that it will get better. After every storm, it's always clear blue skies. That's right. You heard it here. It will get better. Kenny, thank you so much for being here today. That was such an enlightening conversation. And, Hope I you didn't know, talk too much. Not at all, man. That's what you're here for. So, yeah. you know, you, we, we're here to learn. And, you know, what this show is so much about is just showing people how different being Jewish can be to every different person individually. There's a whole spectrum of identity and, and ways that people connect and everybody's got a different endpoint. And Absolutely. so you, you contributed so much to that conversation. So thank you. I appreciate you having me.